take a minute before I get started and thank those that made dinner for us. Always appreciate that. So, quite a week uh, for us, for Sherry and I, and uh, part of that is what led to me to choose this message. You know, I always, uh, because Pastor Rich gives me the freedom to choose pretty much anything I want, and my whole approach to that is, well, what's, what's God teaching me, or what's he taking me through, or what have I been observing in my ministry here that leads me to a message? So, they're all... Um, personal to me. And uh, the title of my message tonight is Hidden with Christ, and it's coming from Colossians chapter 3, and it's going to be a very familiar text to you because it's all about the basics of the faith. And uh, we never get enough basics. I find that no matter what I'm studying or what I'm doing, counseling in particular, if I can just get folks to focus on some of the basics of the faith or the basics of what Jesus teaches us in our marriages or other topics, we would be so much further ahead than to get bogged down with some of the other theological topics that yes, we want to understand and yes, it's good to study, but it's never enough of the basics. So it's some basics tonight. So don't check out on me mentally because I'm telling you the basics, we all need more of it. And I have roughly 15 passages, 15 scriptures that came to me as I prepared this, which is probably more than I normally pick, but because the basics are so important, it becomes quite a little textbook of things. How many times have you been talking to somebody and want to share your faith and you think, I wish I could just think of a scripture that would work for this. I wish I could remember one of the scriptures that was shared with me when I became a new believer. Not, that's not an unusual thing, right? So I have lots of marks in my Bible for these types of things, but all of a sudden I'm preparing a message on basic lifestyle in the faith, and they all just started coming, and I thought, wow, this is really powerful. So our week, Sherry and I had the opportunity to begin at the beginning of the week. We spent three days at the the Oregon Calvary Chapel Pastors Conference, which is the first time that she and I had the opportunity to go. Uh, There was probably roughly 100 ministry leaders there, including some 30-some senior pastors from all over the state of Oregon. Powerful. I'm telling you, we had a great time, but it was really powerful. And uh, walked away from there with some real truth to apply to my own life in ministry. Pastor Rich, as you know, was away in Washington, D.C. at the Israel celebration last week, so he couldn't go. And Pastor Matthew was on vacation with his family, so it was an opportunity for me to go, and we were so blessed. And one of the things I got out of that, which led me to choose this passage tonight, was the truth about ministry. We're all in ministry, are we not? It's not just us who get the opportunity to stand up here, but we're all in ministry. And the truth that some of those senior pastors shared with us was, ministry is not about knowledge, Ministry flows from a life pursuing God. We have to walk out our ministry and experience it personally. And you can imagine there were folks there that were brand new in the ministry. And although we've been serving in this church for many years, being on staff, having the responsibility to bring the word from the pulpit, supporting our pastors as I love to do, it brings on a whole new level of responsibility. And so just being reminded by so many of these pastors across the state that we respect so much that ministry is not about knowledge. So I hope tonight you will kind of take inventory. You know, I often challenge you this way. Take inventory of what's going on in your life as a, a, around this text. If you're able to pull up the notes um, online, that's great. If not, you can pull them up another time. But these scripture references will be a great library for you. And I will interject uh, other personal thoughts as we work through them relative to the text of Colossians 3. So we hear Rich often talk about keep the main thing the main thing. How many of you have been here long enough to hear that in at least one message? Most of you. Keep the main thing the main thing. He is talking to us about, of course, one of the distinctives for Calvary Chapel, and that is to love our God with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strength, with all our soul. 
And if we keep the main thing the main thing, many of the other things that come across churches across America that become distractions will not be a distraction for us. And that's why I chose this text. Keep the main thing the main thing and focus on the basics of the faith. Our walk, our walk should be louder than our talk, right? Our walk should be louder than our talk. How many of us have ever been in the company of someone who's very excited about their faith, been a Christian for a long time, and they will talk somebody out of the gospel in the process of sharing their faith because they're talking about it. Knowledge is good, but it is not ministry, right? We just talked about that. Our walk needs to be louder than our talk. So that's why I chose all these scriptures, and it's a challenge to me. I need this too get up every day and I'm I'm excited to be in ministry but I face challenges every day just like you and uh, we all just are in a different place different place of our journey so Paul's letter a little background Paul's letter here in a nutshell is really just that a review about Christian living so regardless of where you are in your Christian life there is always a tendency is there not to kind of be drawn back to the old life the scriptures talk about taking off the old and putting on the new, and that's certainly part of Paul's text. So he's writing this letter to the church at um, Colossae. Now you probably, if you do a little research, you'll discover that he didn't even plant this church. Uh, Matter of fact, it's not even known to us that Paul ever even visited this church, but that's never stopped Paul before. We've been talking about Paul for a couple weeks since I've been Uh, filling in for Matthew and Paul is direct and he went after young Timothy did he not and charged him with how to conduct himself the church of Ephesus and so now he writes a letter to the church at Colossae why did he write such a letter this church was doing really well in Paul's eyes if you read the history they were bearing fruit lots of converts increasing why did he write it well write it well because a man by the name of Epaphras There's a word for you, Epaphras. He came to him with news that false teachers were coming in to the city and into the church. And he was warning Paul. And Paul, a little bit like my senior pastor, if he hears anything at all that's a little bit out of context or not healthy, he wastes no time at all addressing it. No time at all addressing it. Why would you want to allow something like false teachers in the church begin to fester and find root. Paul was going to hear, not even hear of it. So we learned that about Paul in the past. He does, he does lay down a strong foundation when he feels strongly. Matter of fact, he is very passionate. I love Paul because he always tells it like it is. So when I come across sometimes to men, one-on-one, I'm very direct. Expectations in how they conduct themselves. Expectations about how they treat their wives. It's a passion of mine. And I'm very direct, and sometimes I apologize for having a few rough edges, but then I read about Paul, and I think, I'm nothing. Paul had lots of rough edges. He just always did it in love, and sometimes I need to learn that. Always does it in love. So he wants to lay down a strong foundation for us here, and that's what this text is about. So again, like last week, this is not just, please don't think of this as just another cool story about Paul, or you'll miss it. It's not. It's a story, not just for knowledge. It's a story about how to conduct our lives, how to keep growing in our relationships with Christ and maturing in our faith. Last week I talked about being spiritually wealthy, about having a plan. And Paul was all about that with Timothy. And he really, in some ways, is just continuing that theme right here with the church at Colossae. So chapter 3, the text we're in tonight, Paul speaks of the practical transformation that comes to a believer who is strengthened by the Spirit in their life. We are transformed when we ask Christ into our life. We invite the same power into our life that God used to raise his son from the dead. And I know for many of us, that's just, how do I get my my mind around that? Well, that's what the scriptures tell us. That same power is available to us to fight off things like sin in our life or Satan So this is about putting off the old and putting on the new, and his point about spiritual transformation is a great reminder to us 
about the fleshly indulgence we're tempted in. The world's tempting us everywhere we go. Can't go to the grocery store. You know, I see parents all the time walking their kids to the grocery store, and they're just trying to stay between them and the magazine rack, of all things. Can't look on a a phone anymore. It's a mini computer. Whether it's uh, cookies or whatever they want to call it, there's all kinds of garbage in front of our eyes, is there not? What a day we live in to raise children. I'm sure my parents said the same thing, but Sherry and I weren't carrying around these mini computers. Our kids, it was a long time before they said, oh, well, all my friends have them. You know, I want one. We didn't, we didn't have near as many challenges. Yes, the computer is filled with the same thing. So little by little, what I want to remind us is sometimes we think about the days when we first came to know Jesus and we try to remember how excited we were. Some of us maintain that and are always excited to share the Lord with others. Some of us get a bit lazy and get comfortable. Paul wants none of that here. Little by little, God helps us peel away the old. Little by little. If you try to do it like a fire hose and do it all at one time, you'll get discouraged. And you'll think, Lord, I'm just not worthy. But in this text, little by little, he's trying to remind us to peel back the old, make room for the new. So let's read the text together, and I'm going to start in uh, verse 1 of Colossians 3 and read through 17, verse 17. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator." Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Remember that as we get to the end tonight, and I'll have a challenge for all of you. As he says, you must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What a great passage. So look at verse 5. Interesting, verse 5. Look at this list. They didn't have it all together, and we don't have it all together either. You can fill in the name that's a struggle for you. may not be one of these. May, may be similar, maybe not. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. It's quite a list. So what do you struggle with? We have to deal with this in our lives all the time. What do you struggle with? What's on your list? If you tell me, no, I got it all together, there's just no way. We all have a list. 
I have a list, you have a list. We're not going to air those. Not tonight anyways. But I'd like you to be honest with yourself and think about what is on your list. What's in the way of this wonderful growth that Paul is calling the folks at Colossae. His strength and power in us gives us victory over sin. His being Christ himself. Thus the title of my message, Hidden with Christ. It's in the early verses. Our life is hidden with him through the power of the Lord as when we come to know him. And that strength and power gives us victory over sin. I didn't say we don't struggle, but it does give us victory. You have to keep on practicing putting off the old. I wish I could say that, boy, after you became a Christian and you changed your lifestyle and you changed your friends and you recognized the things that you wanted to have to be different and you started seeing Christ in your life and feeling him speak to you, I wish I could tell you it was easy. But as I've learned, the closer I get to him, the more I learn about him, the further I realize I have to go. He is so unbelievably holy and powerful. We just can't explain it away by saying, well, I'm a Christian. I have nothing more to worry about. I call that fire insurance. That is not the Christian life, the victorious Christian life we should be satisfied with. Treat those distractions or addictions as sin in your life. There are many in this country that treat addictions as, well, it's okay. People just need to know that you have this problem and uh, accept that you're a victim and that's, you know, we'll be praying for you. I say Jesus calls it out as sin. It's sin in our life. And healing comes when we realize that some of these struggles are sin. Not to be explained away, not to be forgiven, not to be accepted. It's sin in our life, and we should deal with it as such because the scriptures give us the power over sin. So when you came to faith in Jesus Christ, you brought a lot of the old life with you. And just as just a reminder tonight that little by little, God helps us peel it away. So it doesn't matter where you are in your journey. It doesn't matter whether you just became a believer or you've been one for many years. It doesn't matter whether you have yet to make that commitment. The thing you would learn tonight is there is a process. Christ is waiting on you. He's knocking on the door. He wants to help you. And you will have help peeling away the old. Some of us have been believers a long time. And we get comfortable. We think, well, uh, we've peeled away a lot. And a few things I'm still working on, I'm just going to keep working on them. And Pastor Rich will remind us, never find yourself caught in what he calls the miserable middle. The miserable one, trying to keep one foot in life the way it used to be and one foot in life new. It's a miserable place to be. And I always tell people, if you want to learn more about the miserable middle, you go to Revelations where Jesus says, if lukewarmness, I'd rather spit you out of my mouth than have you be lukewarm. He'd rather be on, be on the corner proclaiming the gospel than to be ignoring him and saying, well, I'm a believer. I don't need to tell anybody. Here's the first of one of the many verses I want to share tonight. It comes from James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Pastor Rich gave me an illustration on this from Israel. You know, Israel lived in the slavery and oppression of Egypt for 400 years. 400 years. God miraculously set them free from, through Moses, right? The way the story goes. But setting them free from their old way of thinking was different, a different thing altogether. They were thrilled to be free, but they, didn't, they weren't ready and didn't know how to shed their old ways. They kept thinking about their old ways. So this goes back a long time, this challenge, about taking off the old and putting on the new. Isaiah 43, verses 17 and 18. Who brings forth a chariot and horse, army and warrior? They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember, not the former things, nor consider the things of old. They want us to put away, Paul is talking here about putting away the old way of treating others. Not just our lifestyle, but how do we treat others? 
Verse 8 talks about, but now you must put them all away. James 3, 9. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be. And again in James chapter 1. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. These are strong words to heed now. Our maturity and faith is determined by how we manage all these lists in Colossians. Are we growing? Are we putting on the new? Or are we stuck on some of these? We might just need some help. There's people here and in our church who would love to help you, whether it's a men's group, a ladies' group, a Bible study group, being consistently attending here under Rich and Matthew's teaching. There is all kinds, all kinds of meat being offered to help you in this, these areas. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, all things, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. So this brings us to the topic of anger, and anger I talked about, I call it, it's part of Satan's sandbox. It devastates folks, and we all have a little bit of that, and some of us quite a bit of that, and Paul taught us about that, and we should be giving up this sin of anger through the, through the life we have in Christ, through the power we have through his son. Proverbs 16, 32 says, whoever is slow, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit, than he who makes a city, who takes a city. That's a pretty strong proverb. He, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Puts it in perspective. Followed by putting away our lying tongues. Putting away our lying tongues. Truth is very important to God. I don't need to tell you that. You all know that. No one comes to the Father but through me, he says. I am the truth and I am the life. Lying and deception. Part of, part of our nature, but not his character. Part of our nature, but not his character. John 8, 44 and 45. You are your father. You are of your father, the devil. You will is to do, your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Of course, we're talking about Satan. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. So it's challenging here in the Gospel of John about folks not putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Relationships, our relationships are built on trust, are they not? And truth. Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. That being said, Paul also elsewhere in the text speaks about truth, that we should be speaking truth in love, not just speaking truth. An illustration so let's say that my wife, and she'll cringe now when I say that. Let's say that my wife comes to me and says, uh, how do you like this dress? How do you like this dress on me? And uh, some of you would say, well, I don't know what to say. It's really outdated, and I don't want to tell her that, and I really don't like it. But Pastor Sean told me to tell the truth. But I'm telling you now, it's better to say something like, you look good in anything, honey, but I prefer a different dress. Pastor Rich and I kicked that around because he always has something to say. I liked my version better. So put on the new self, put on the new self. In verse 11, Christ was and is made available to all of us, all of us, as he says in verse 11. If you prayed to receive Christ sometime in your life, which most of you have, if you cr prayed that prayer, God created a new person in you. He created a new person in you. Amen? And all of you were so excited about that, and you were excited about telling others, me included. I was a one-man wrecking crew on my baseball team in college, and everybody was like, whoa, man, slow down. And that's just all that was always important to me 
was these guys needed to know who Jesus Christ was. We've all kind of been there and worn those shoes. God gave us, created in us a new person. Paul is saying God created it, now live it. Paul created it, now live it. He's not giving us a hall pass here. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is a spirit. Remember the Samaritan woman Jesus approached. I did a lesson on it a few months ago. He spoke to her about living water. And what did she do? Sir, give me some of that water. She really was kind of clueless in the story about what he was offering her. Give me some of that water, she answered. Then she proceeded to say, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you said it correctly. You tell the truth, for you have had five husbands. And the one whom you are now with is, your, is not your husband. This you have said truly. Why did Jesus even speak to this gal? Why? Why? Clearly, he knew the kind of woman that this was. It was a Samaritan woman. His disciples wondered, why did we go this way? They're sleeping. Why speak to her at all? Well, his answer, it wasn't about the kind of woman he was speaking to, was it? It was about so he could show us in the story the kind of heart God had towards sinners. It was well worth his time to keep that appointment. And you know, as the story goes on, she dropped her pail and ran back to the village and said, you've got to come. Dropped her pail. Probably one of the most important things she had to carry to go get water. And she brought back the village. It's a great story about Jesus' heart towards sinners. One, just one woman along that trail. He wants us to put on a compassionate heart, a compassionate heart. You know, it's easy to become religious and begin to look down on others that aren't like us. And uh, as my wife and I challenge each other in our walk and in our studies, she will remind me and others, you know, it's easy to like people who are just like us. It's easy. But when someone doesn't look like us, doesn't act like us, doesn't know Jesus, uh, might be awkward, uh, sometimes we go the other way. It's hard, harder to love them. Not what Jesus would do, is it? Not what he would do. It's not what Paul is talking about in this text. They want us to have a heart like Jesus, a heart full of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Luke 7, 36. It's a long passage. I'll crunch it down to one sentence. He who is forgiven much, loves much. He who is forgiven much, loves much. He did all this for us, and yet we struggle sometimes with this basic Christian practice. Put on forgiveness would be my next point. When you put on a new self with Jesus Christ, it is often seen in how we forgive others. Verse 13, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive forgive. Peter once asked Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I have to forgive him? You know the story. And and Peter said what? Up to seven times, Lord? And what did Jesus say? Matthew 18, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. This is tough, I know it's tough. But it's what we're called to, be more like Jesus. When we forgive, we become like him. He's, how much did he forgive us? What do the scriptures say? He cast our sins as far from the east as from the west up on that cross, and yet we want to hold on to some things. We want to put people in a box. We get mad just driving down the road and somebody cuts us off where there's actually a lane for people to merge. We just don't want anybody in that lane because that is my space. You know what I'm talking about. What's on your list? I see this people squirming in the seats. We all do it. We all have a list. But he's transforming us little by little 
from the old to the new, little by little. Let him mold you. Sometimes it's uncomfortable, like a piece of clay that's dry. Let him put moisture on that for you and make it easier to mold. Psalm 103.12, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. That's a wonderful verse. I can't tell you how many times I use that with folks who come to see me who are just defeated. They know Jesus Christ, but they're just defeated. They're going through challenges in their life and they just feel they're so unworthy. How is the Lord going to love me enough to help me? Pretty clear how much. Pretty clear how much. So here's a statement about forgiveness I want to challenge you with. It is my opinion that if we carry around unforgiveness, if we carry around bitterness because unforgiveness leads to that, if we're doing that, it makes our Christian walk ineffective. It's not a deep theological reach for me to suggest that if we're carrying around unforgiveness and bitterness, how can we be effective in our Christian walk? Most of you would all say, well, no, I, I, don't, I want to be effective but yet, if I, we were honest with each other, we would discover that many of us have some unforgiveness in our life towards others. Maybe it happened today. Family members. My goodness, with what's going on in Washington, D.C. these days, we have family members that are at odds with one another. Unforgiveness. I believe the truth alone today requires a response from us. And I'm going to ask you to think about that when we close today. This whole topic of unforgiveness. Verse 14, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Now, in, in, in America, in the Western culture, we use the word love pretty loosely to describe a lot of things. That's not what he's talking about. This is agape love. This is the type of love that Jesus threw out on our behalf when he hung on that cross. That's the type of love he's talking about. You can count on it kind of love. Sacrificial love. This is what he's talking about. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I challenge every young man in every wedding ceremony I do to love his bride as Christ loved the church. And we talk about in the ceremony what an amazing love that is that he gave his only son and that's the love that the grooms are being called to as believers when they love their wives. Amen. Now, ladies, I don't let you off easy in the wedding ceremonies, but that's the one that came to mind today. Love is what defines us. Jesus came to love. He came for sinners, but he came for love. It is his character John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's a great verse. Followed by 1 Corinthians 13, 2, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. Process that in your own life. Can you imagine living your full life and not learning how to love the way Jesus loves you? How sad. If you are a Christian here today and you find yourself harboring bitterness, I'm telling you, you'll find yourself ineffective in your Christian walk. May it never be. A few months ago, I'm going to wrap up with a story. A few months ago, I stood before you and asked for prayer about a challenge that Sherry and I had. You know my story. We had a business. I've been under Rich's mentoring for years here. And we had a business we wanted to sell so I could come on staff. And we were going through some challenges. Selling a business is, not, is sometimes a messy thing. But we knew this was where God wanted us. And I asked for prayer in that, and I saw some bitterness taking up space in my heart because I wanted, sometimes the things we want that are good become so controlling they become bad. Do you follow me? So I wanted so bad to be here, I became bitter towards those that I was negotiating the sale of my business with because it was dragging out, it was, just wasn't going very smoothly. 
legal documents that kept growing, and I was getting bitter. I, didn't, I spent my energy trying to figure out how to make this okay, and it was very difficult. And many of you did pray. And over the course of a month or so, the Lord found a way to give us godly results. He's removed that bitterness. Resolved the impasse we had. Brought closure to all of this in an amicable way. So Sherry and I can look forward, not look back. We're so thankful. Didn't mean it wasn't painful now. It was painful. But he often uses painful things to teach us great lessons, doesn't he? There are some things I could not have learned in my Christian walk, like he's describing here, if I hadn't have gone through some of these challenges. Couldn't have taught me those things. So don't resist them so much. So we're already loved beyond anything we could imagine. We talk about Christ giving his life. We're already loved beyond anything we could imagine. The blessing of giving love, however, is what comes back to you. Pouring into others. Pouring into others. And my last verse reference is 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. It's just an awesome verse. So I'm going to close in prayer for all of us, and I'm going to ask you, to everyone, to stand for this prayer, if you would. Stretch your legs, and this is, the Lord's put this on my heart, and I'm going to issue a challenge to you while you stand there and think about all of the things that distract you from your growth. And just bow your heads and close your eyes and pray with me, if you would. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for the love that you poured out on us. And Father, we thank you for Paul, for calling it out for calling out a lifestyle that required that we shed those old ways and little by little allow you to put on a new life in us. Lord, I thank you for the testimony of many here who have come so far in their walk with Christ. And yet, Father, we know there are things because your word is impressing upon us tonight, the idea that if we are not forgiving others, if we're holding back forgiveness for pain in our life, individuals, things in our life that have hurt us, creating bitterness. Lord, I believe you want us to do business with that. How freeing would it be, Lord, right now in the quiet of our seats as we stand here, that we would say, Lord, I have this going on in my life. And in the quiet of our own personal prayers, we ask you to help us to forgive that person or people. Lord, I believe that's what you're calling us to do so we can be free in Christ indeed. Father, that we not leave here tonight carrying that bitterness. Your word says to give that all to you, to let you have any revenge that's necessary in our life, not to carry that around and allow Satan to use it to distract us. So Father, in the quiet of our seats as we stand here, I challenge each one here to ask you as we go into worship to help them to forgive where they need to forgive. I just know in a group this size, people are carrying around bitterness. I thank you, Lord, in my own life for freeing me of that. Oh, how it peels the crust off our eyes when you we're not holding ill will towards others, not forgiving others. So, Father, I ask that now in Jesus' precious name and that everyone here would say amen to the power they have in Jesus. And all God's people said, amen.